Well, hello. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of my colleague, William Kagan. Uh, Bill had the pleasure of attending a conference here quite a number of years ago uh, and, and uh, in, encouraged us to submit this paper, but was, un was unfortunately unable to attend. This uh, paper, I think, fits very nicely coming right after Hamid's uh, discussion because we are thinking about many things. And I should say that while I am in a business school, my colleague is not. And this is perhaps what gives me the freedom to think about these things. <laughs> while uh, he teaches in business schools, but he's not a tenured faculty member attached to a business school. So I think that makes a big difference in his uh, possibilities of thinking. He's also a very broad thinker. So uh, uh, the same questions that got you thinking about democracy got us thinking as well uh, about a, very, a variety of institutions that um, have spread around the world, uh, capitalism, democracy, libertarianism, voluntarism, all of these things which um, we see quite profoundly in the United States and in many other places around the world. And we do have a grave concern for how this affects the common good. I think the um, call for papers for this conference was quite provocative in putting the idea out there that the common good is not being thoroughly considered and it may not be best served by these institutions. So uh, what captured the, the interest of uh, Bill and me was thinking about change and thinking about the fact that none of these institutions are, are singular. They are institutions, democracies, varieties of capitalism, um, and they are expressed in various ways around the world. And thus, we wanted to be uh, considerate of things that were happening that might not be the mainstream, that might not be the most obvious examples, and look to these efforts at the margins to better understand um, how the common good may be being constructed here and now in a different way. And we took our inspiration from a sociologist, not a business school professor, <laughs> named Hughes, who um, encourages us that uh, we cannot fully understand unless we look at the not quite made it or the things that have not quite been there yet. Uh, in terms of organizations in society, we can't fully understand unless we consider those. So in our discussions, uh, Bill and I derived several examples of these kinds of things. And one that stuck in our minds or, or was quite prominent was this idea of social entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurship. The idea that social ventures would exist that would be rooted in capitalism, perhaps in democracy, but with the idea or the intent that they don't exist merely to serve a profit-making motive, but that there is also a common good motive that is vested in the very DNA of the organization, in the very foundation of it. And um, as it happens, a uh, news show on, in the U.S., the PBS News Hour, news hour which is a public broadcasting station, which is perhaps one of the, the best intellectual broad thinking um, television news stations in the U.S., maybe the only one, <laughs> some would say, uh, had presented a wonderful show on uh, uh, social entrepreneurs and the rise of a new form of corporation called the B Corporation, which stands for Benefit Corporation. And so there's some new legislation. We'll see if I can get this to work, whether it will, will play um, sound for us or not. Yes. New York State that will officially recognize companies with a conscience. There's no reason that you can't care about the world and also care about your own business. The folks at the Tribeca offices of nonprofit B Lab are behind the law which creates a new corporate class called a benefit corporation. Firms that make money and a positive impact on society. Seven states have already passed benefit corp legislation. B-Lab co-founder Andrew Kasoy. Existing corporate law was built for maximization of shareholder value. And so the, the, the legal innovation here is that idea that the directors and, and the officers of the company are now protected uh, to be able to consider a broader set of interests. The law protects firms that file as benefit corporations from shareholder lawsuits that could otherwise charge they didn't maximize profits. B Corps are legally mandated to maximize social benefits as well. So this is quite a change in the United States to have a legal form where 
a, a corporation is mandated to serve the common good as well as to serve a profit-seeking motive. And as, as the clip said, seven states have adopted such legislation and uh, quite a few others are considering it. Interestingly, it required the creation of a nonprofit organization to promote and develop this idea such that legislation could be <coughs> passed in various places. Um, so we see this as one of the areas on the margins. And we found this to be an area that was ripe for co the conversation about the very issues that you've mentioned, about changes. What does capitalism mean? What does democracy mean? And how do we re-envision our organizations going forward in the future? So I'll just pay, play you another piece of uh, that conversation. What they're doing is they're saying, we're going to redefine what it means to be successful in business. We're perfectly happy to make money. We recognize that that's important. But we're not here to make money. We're here to make a difference. And the money that we make helps fuel the difference we can make. But wait a minute. Socially responsible firms have been about to make the difference my entire career. So why is this year different? E-Lab co-founder Bart Houlihan. You have all the elements of a marketplace, yet it wasn't quite accelerating. And then you put on top of it, you put on top of it, the financial collapse. When the broader public started to really doubt business and you create a positive alternative, all of a sudden we're preaching to the choir. Back at the B-Lab party, lawyer Alan Bromberger was skeptical that social mindedness spells success. If you have to pay 39 cents more for widget to buy from a company that doesn't use child labor, you're not going to be able to have the cheapest price in the marketplace necessarily, and ultimately this stuff is all going to be decided in the market. So the movement could be successful. It could well be that in 10 years, this is just a standard part of doing business in America, and nobody thinks anything special about it. Or it could be, or it could be a fad that came and went. It could be the mini skirt of the 2012. <laughs> Who knows? At the moment, though, the movement looks lively enough, with bills making business with a conscience legal, pending from Colorado to North Carolina. Okay, so the example here is that we have a potential point of change which we may be able to observe in real time. Uh, with this idea of the B Corporation, the Benefit Corporation, and it may give us the opportunity to do some good empirical study of uh, the underlying changes. And, and as I think the, co the, the um, piece suggests, is this different from our traditional beliefs about social, or social responsibility? Is this different from CSR? Is this um, just uh, a new uh, old wine in a new bottle? <laughs> Is it something that represents a sea change or just a fad? So we are very interested in examining, examining this as one way of looking at whether capitalism is changing and whether the common good is changing in association with that. One of the uh, examples that they gave of, of why this legislation was so important was looking at a company that in the United States that has been long known for its um, social good and its social impact. One of the very few companies in the United States to have restrictions on CEO salaries, for example, and that's Ben & Jerry's, an ice cream company. And when Ben & Jerry, the original owners, sold the company, they were actually required to sell to essentially the highest bidder by corporate law, whereas they would have preferred to sell to another entity that would have preserved more of their values and more of their social good, common good orientation, they were unable to do that because of the legal restrictions that were in place. They sold to Unilever. So, yes, they sold to Unilever, <laughs> exactly. So where are we coming from theoretically in looking at these issues? We are looking at this um, from both a perspective of stability and a perspective of change. My own background is in uh, institutional theory, institutionalism, which um, the neo-institutionalists are interested in both stability and change. Uh, Bill has, has more of a sociological background, and so together we bring uh, quite an interesting set of perspectives. We are interested in, in what is now and understanding that, and as well as what may be. And thus we draw on um, the fundamentals of capitalism and, and Adam Smith and the basics of 
social fact, as Durkheim and Berger and, and Luck Luckman have said, as well as the idea of creative destruction, the idea that these institutions are not permanent and that through inflection points, like the idea of social entrepreneurship, we see innovations that may affect many of the institutions that underlie corporations and may have an ultimate influence on how the common good is expressed. So in order to bring together perspectives on stability and change, we adopt a perspective called the social world, social arena framework. Um, some other frameworks that are able to span these are ideas such as structuration uh, or um, actor network theory, Latour and Callan. We focus on this a bit more because uh, Becker was my co-author's uh, <laughs> lead professor and, and he's quite familiar with this theory. It's the theory that we have social worlds which are rather fixed and these represent the idea of stability and we have negotiated orders within these social worlds and they're represented by communities of actors working together. And at the same time, there are areas of contestation, which are the arenas where we are attempting to renegotiate the order and attempting to um, set change into motion. So in attempting to understand, uh, we are interested in looking at a variety of concepts, many broad concepts, and going to that higher order level of analysis, just as Hamid has. We ha have initially thought about these philosophies or these approaches to how we work and thought about them in terms of institutions as well as societal sectors because this issue of societal sectors seems to keep emerging. Uh, is it the state's responsibility? Is it the private sector's responsibility? And in the U.S. in particular, we have a very str strong nonprofit or civil society sector uh, which accounts for a, a relatively large percentage of uh, the GDP, GDP and employment. And so these three sectors are often seen as quite distinct and they may work together, but um, the rules and laws that seem to apply to them, the institutional expectations that seem to apply to them have, um, are, are quite separate and quite different. So we thought it would be helpful to explore the world, the social worlds as they exist according to these sectors right now. And we did reflect and observe that these sectors have become dominated by large organizations. So in the private sector, we see Unilever, we see uh, General Motors, we see any number of large multinational firms that uh, have dominate the sector. Our paper traces the, the development from um, the original industrial revolution and a second wave of industrial revolution in the early part of the 20th century and describes how we've moved away from SMEs and community-based organizations to these very large organizations that are not community-based or that are much more global in nature. In the public sector, um, certainly national governments can be quite large and imposing, but we have these overarching uh, governmental or quasi-governmental institutions and organizations such as the United Nations. And even in the nonprofit world, we see things like the Red Cross, which has become a very large international organization, as well as at the national level, it's quite, quite well developed. So what is the consequence of having these large scale organizations? Well, they take on a power which uh, dictates the way things should be done. So in, in answer to the earlier question of is, it, um, is, is one vote possible for shareholders, uh, is that a reality? Well, the large organizations are dictating whether that is possible or not. And um, the ideas of governance uh, are very much uh, in question as to whether they are uh, appropriately carried out, as particularly in the private sector, which is one reason why business has not uh, necessarily engaged with these constructs as well as it might have. So. Uh, we were interested in exploring, as I said, the wor social worlds as they are, and we took our approach from these three sectors and wanted to explore what the definitions of the common good might be from these sectors. So starting with the, the private sector, we can turn to Adam Smith and say that the definition of the common good, it relates to economic pr prosperity. It is, in fact, the ends that we are interested in. We are interested in increasing economic opportunity, increasing economic success, um, philanthropic efforts are possible as a result of that. So simply by raising the level of the standard of living, the common good is well served. <laughs> and that's, that's quite a narrow framing and it um, 
does not engage beyond a transactional type of level and focuses on the ends rather than the means to the ends. And we'll see in the public sector that we have a much more processual view and engagement view. Uh, this idea of democracy and democratic engagement is uh, essential. It's not simply the outcomes. It's not the result of a vote that matters as much as engagement in the process, in the dialogue. Um, so the common good comes from this idea of public goods and managing share shared resources. Finally, in the nonprofit sector, we have even more of a community-oriented perspective. Uh, Dewey, who is well known for his work in education, also had some things to say about the common good, in particular the civil society sector. And the idea that um, it, we have a collective responsibility as communities to be responsible for the common good. And we do that through communities of interest, whether those communities of interest are, are around education, similar professional goals, social values, uh, religion. There are many, many uh, ways that these communities can be constituted. But again, it's an orientation towards involvement in the process and not just a transactional view. So in looking at, at these sectors of the common good, uh, we began to try to understand these from a perspective other than fixed social worlds. And so this may represent a, sort of an idealized view of how society is and how society has developed. Particularly in the United States, I think it is, does reflect um, global uh, perspectives in many places. Our interest is in shifting a view our view from the pure stability of this three-sectored world and perhaps breaking down some of the, the barriers amongst these perspectives. And instead, thinking from the per perspective of negotiated order and the interaction of these social worlds. So we want to go beyond the markets and the hierarchies and the social networks and, and to think a little bit more deeply about um, disorganization and reorganization and negotiation rather than stability. Thus, our perspective was to reframe our understanding of business and the common good. And interestingly, we also had to turn to Harvard Business Review to find uh, a definition that would give us some uh, insights into business from a non-traditional capitalist perspective. Now, this is really quite significant. This is a fairly recent article published by Rosabeth Moss Cantor. And she makes an argument that um, I think would have Milton Friedman turning over in his grave. <laughs> she says businesses are purpose-driven entities imbued with social value and individual values that should not be dominated solely by economic logic. For this to appear in a predominant uh, publication which is targeted towards top executives in large multinational corporations is rather significant, I think. And so, in trying to think about this and thinking about the restructuring and perhaps the, the integration of the sectors, uh, we drew upon this notion of the triple helix, which is, is uh, here. So if you're familiar with the idea, the triple helix implies that the strands or the segments, in this case three strands or sectors of society, can separate and recombine. And they, this is an analogy that represents both um, reproduction and evolution simultaneously. So we think this might be a fruitful analogy for beginning to understand how societal change can um, help the common good. Just want to mention a few more things in my very limited time about uh, social entrepreneurship, that uh, social entrepreneurs are challenging the existing order. They are going beyond the uh, institutional frames that exist for capitalism and exist for profit-seeking entities and throwing away many of those uh, ideas. And we are beginning to see some change according to Scott's Pillars of Institutionalism that we have this new regulatory, uh, this new legal form, the B Corp. We have uh, social normative change in that multinationals and corporations of all kinds are interested in reporting their social uh, and environmental consequences as well as their economic consequences and that we have some cultural cognitive change in that we have an academic field emerging with degree programs around this notion of social entrepreneurship. Uh, we have several other examples as well, which I don't have time to talk about, but we see several other activities happening at the margins uh, and intend to pursue our empirical research around both social entrepreneurship and ideas such as the notion of orphan drugs, 
where there is not a sufficient market to support the development, the economic development of medical treatments for small numbers of people who are afflicted by things, but uh, the science exists and the possibility exists um, to cure these diseases. So creating the incentives um, for businesses or with the te existing technology to solve these problems to actually solve them. And so, I finish. <laughs> Thank you.